Welcome, friends, to Game Master's Studio, where we talk shop about running tabletop role-playing games. With us today is Jared and Ed, with your host, Jerry. Hello, and welcome to Game Master's Studio. We'll, we'll be talking about tips, tricks, and advice for tabletop role-playing games. Hopes that maybe you can use some of these at home to bring your own game up to the next level. Today we'll be talking about developing a memorable and full-fledged antagonist for your PCs to go up against and help make that story something that's a little bit more than just your classic good versus evil. My name is Jerry, a.k.a. Frieden. I'm host and moderator today. With me in the studio is Jared, a.k.a. DMF, proprietor of Mad Doc Designs, creator of the World of Wrath, and semi-professional GM, and Ed. Coming soon to a theater near you. So today we will be talking about antagonists. Um, we do want to start by saying that antagonist isn't necessarily a bad person. The protagonists are your player characters, generally. Um, they are the stars of the story. They are the ones that we're following as we go around. And the antagonist is the person or persons or sometimes force that's in opposition to their goals. Usually this is a recurring character, although you can also have a series of antagonists. As they overcome each one, the next one steps up. And it's really a main source of conflict for the games. So, for making a, a good, strong antagonist, where do you want to start? Well, I think one thing you have to start with is what kind of antagonist uh, are you looking to make? Um, I think the most typical would be kind of the, uh, uh, you know, the the villain, the kind of almost, even almost over the top villain character who is running everything. Uh, it could be the uh, the you know the big bad guy, or it could be the big bad guy's dragon. Uh, that's a that's a trope. If you may not know that, the dragon is kind of the physical presence for uh, a villain who might be a little bit more brainy. So, for instance. Yeah. Uh, uh, in, uh, in in Die Hard, you had uh, um, you had Hans Gruber, who was the brains behind the operation, but that that big blonde Carl. German Carl Carl with a K. He was he was kind of the dragon. He was the one that did all the physical things that needed to be done. So I'm familiar with it. The example that I often hear cited is Star Wars. Emperor Palpatine is the bad guy, but Darth Vader is the dragon. Sure, definitely. Yep. yep. Um, Muscle. Which is also uh, something that I wanted to bring up for mine for starting an antagonist is I think it's very important for an antagonist to believe that what they're doing is correct. Yes. Um, Darth Vader and, and Emperor Palpatine from Star Wars believed that they were bringing order to the galaxy. Mm -hmm. um, Magneto from the X-Men, I want to save my race. I want to help my people. You know, If you have an antagonist who believes what they're working in, then it makes it much more believable and helps, I feel, to create a richer story than just, I'm evil because I'm evil. Yeah, well, belief is a powerful thing. you know, And it also forces your protagonists the error doesn't force them, but it presents them with the opportunity to attempt to see their side of things, yeah. to see the antagonist, you know, from their point of view. It makes things go. You know, it offers shades of gray instead of just pure black and white, it, which always makes the story more interesting. It forces them to question their conviction over whether or not they're doing the yeah. right thing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you know there's so for, so for you, Jared, for starting off, you know, what what's the first thing that you try to think about when you're working on an antagonist? Well, what I was going to say is there's a lot of, you know, typically when you're creating your adventure, there's, in my opinion, there's, atypically I have two approaches. Either I start with the story and then fill in the antagonist, or I start with the antagonist and fill in the story. Typically, I do start with the antagonist. So I kind of have, you know, the the pin point of the pin itself of, you know, the, the, the prick, as it were, <laughs> um... Of <laughs> <laughs> Which is a term your players will be using to refer to your antagonist. Yes. Uh, you know, so I kind of, you know... To, Amongst other things. You know, I have that fleshed out. I know, I know where that sharp edge is coming from. Um, you know, like in one of my big games, I had Clarissa, you know, the, the, the eight-year-old female vampire that's really like... Or she looks like an eight-year-old that's really like over 2,000 years old. I like to 
come from different angles. Again, you know, like you don't expect a little eight year old girl to be the the bad guy or the antagonist. You know, the the B B E G big bad evil guy. Um, so I like to be creative in that, but I don't usually. If I'm going to come up with a more out of the box antagonist, you know, something where it's again like the the cleric that's you know lawful neutral that thinks that he's following the the order of his god but really and you know in the reality at least from the, the player's perspective is gonna murder a whole town for whatever reason you know I'm, you know without going into any kind of details or specifics but he thinks he's doing the right thing that usually comes from like i have a story first and then i'm like hey want to be cool if you know, I, I come up with an idea after the fact, and it just kind of, it's one of those things that usually just kind of comes to me, like, wouldn't it be cool if we did something like this to screw with the players? I think you're absolutely right, though, that a good antagonist should be able to generate stories. Yeah. You know, you, the antagonist should have things that they want, stuff that they want to happen, and that's going to make stories happen. That's going to be things that maybe the PCs don't want to happen, or they have a different idea for what should be done with the gold mine outside of town. Right. Um, and I think that can really help build and draw those stories and draw them into a natural conflict mm -hmm. which with the PCs, which can help build that you know antagonistic relationship. Yeah, they shouldn't just exist just to exist. I mean, I suppose occasionally you could have that. Yeah, you know, the minor person, antagonists. You know. Yeah, the, the person who is evil because they're just evil. And sometimes you'll and that's wind, fine. Yeah, sometimes you'll wind up doing that just because I've had so many morally gray characters. Maybe it's time to have somebody who falls solidly into the evil spectrum of the alignment just so that the players can unequivocally trounce this guy because that person is wrong, what they are doing is wrong, we are in the right. And to have yeah. that be a change from what they've done and to mix it up and have a little a little yeah. more of an unambiguous yeah. circumstance. Sometimes it's nice to know that you can fireball the guy and not have to worry about like let's shackle him and take him to town and let the, the law decide what you know if it was right or wrong. You know, yeah. sometimes it's just nice to be like I have a vorpal blade off with his head. Another nice point that you brought up there is, you know, shackle him, bring him into town, let the law decide what's right or wrong. It's also very possible for your antagonist to perhaps be in a morally superior position to the NP to the to the party. Um, the specific example that I brought up when we were originally discussing the topic was Expector Javert from Les Miserables, who is doing his job. I won't need to take this escaped convict and felon back to prison so that he's not at loose where he's a danger to society. And it's very hard to look at that and say that character is morally incorrect because he's doing his job. He's trying to protect people. Yeah. But he is to the T an excellent antagonist yeah. for the Jean Valjean character to have to deal with. Yeah, exactly. Antagonist only really means someone who is opposing the group. Someone who is trying to stop them from doing what they're doing. And that's a perfect example. Um, and, and in that case, he's a criminal, so he was going after him to try to bring him to justice. But because of the way the story is written, he's the antagonist. Yeah, there are plenty of stories where, like, the best friend can be the antagonist. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I'm trying to stop you from making what could be a bad decision. Like, you're almost playing, like, the villain, but, you know, for whatever reason, your, your thought process is skewed, or maybe you are completely in the right, but your friend doesn't agree with you. So there's there's lots of gray areas where you could you know and you can take advantage of that. Um, back to what Jerry was saying with the whole antagonists have point of views, though. Um, uh, that's, that's very much where I typically approach my adventures in general or my stories in general is I come up with an antagonist this is their primary goal and then I set smaller minor goals of how they're going to eventually obtain their major goal like okay Clarissa the vampire wants to you know like vampires are mostly or all but extinct in wrath up until this point Clarissa is the last surviving vampire she wants to reintroduce vampires to this world but first she needs to reattain her full power so she's got point, you know, plot A, which leads to plot B, which leads to plot C, which leads to G, H, you know, all the way down to Z. And eventually when you hit Z, then we're like, all right, now finally the master plan has unfolded. But there's a lot of little steps to get there, which presents you a lot of opportunities of how you can redirect your story, you know, especially if you're doing more of a sandboxy thing like we talked about in the last episode. So, 
say the adventuring party interrupts plot A. Well, if plot A was interrupted, I know plot B through Z, and I know Z is the final, ultimate goal. How would this character, being a fleshed-out person character, how would they redirect themselves? How would they recover from that failure or that, that you know, the players having stopped them? Okay, the players, like, this isn't, you know, like, for example, like, okay, they stopped the bank robbery. Okay, well, they stopped that bank robbery. How else can I get money? Right. You know, it, it puts other things in motion. And having the antagonist's plans planned out also allows you to take into account, well, what happens if they succeed? What if the protagonist failed to stop them or don't even think to try stopping them? Okay, well, where does it go now? You know, it's very likely that you're running a superhero game and Dr. Mayhem is going to be robbing banks to get money and the superheroes are like, well, we need to save the Earth from aliens. We don't need to care about some bank robbers. So they hear about some robberies going on and then once the robberies are done, you know where it's going from there and it escalates. Right, yeah. This also lets the antagonists come in and, okay, they stop Dr. Mayhem from unleashing his ray that will turn all pizzas in the city into anchovy pizzas. Oh, God! <laughs> And when they stop them, they find that, oh, this is all the missing money from the banks. We could have stopped this earlier if we had only stopped those bank robberies. Yeah. Um, you know, building that cohesion into it and showing the PCs a little bit further down the road that, well, your actions back then had consequences. Yeah. Definitely let them let them win at times, but if, if it's really not part of it, let them... Uh, let let their success mean something later. That's, that's I yeah, guess, what I'm trying to... build off of their success. Exactly. Yeah. The antagonist or the protagonist? The antagonist. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Know how to build off this, their success. And, and by let them win, I do mean one way of creating, a, I guess, a, a more memorable antagonist, but, you know, they... It's always great. You build your antagonist, you think everything's fine, you run the session, and then your mage and your ranger kill them in round number two. And that sucks. Now, you can roll with that. You can say, okay, well, his brother is going to come avenge him. you know. Or the next time you think up one of your antagonists, think up an escape route. Yeah. You know, Don't actually have him be part of the, the deal. Have him kind of look at everything and be like, well, i got to go do this other thing. So he just gets gone, and the encounter is everything else but him. Show him off before you really put him in a scenario and give him escape routes. You know. yeah. The other thing you can do to quickly adapt to say, okay, this was supposed to be my big bad evil guy or my, my big antagonist. They killed them with some role, some lucky rolls. I don't want to deprive them of that. Right. Okay, little did they know that there's a man behind the curtain. Right, exactly. You know what I mean? Next yeah. thing you know, that was no longer the big bad evil guy. The other guy was pulling that guy's strings yeah. or he was a henchman to so-and-so. Okay, you had only met up to this rank, but there's other ranks even higher than that person yeah. that now you get to that now get to come into play. And you've got you've got two classic um, villain moves that you can pull from right there. One being X has failed me. Don't you fail me? And a new person gets in and just picks up the plot right where it left off. Right. And the other classic villain play being fine. I'll do it myself. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, you can bring in a new antagonist this way and let the PC show that, oh, this was a bigger pl plot than we thought. Yeah. And add extra weight to it without necessarily having to scrap all of your plans because you expected this guy to get captured or get away, and instead he got you know an arrow through yeah. the throat. Yeah, it adds even Groups more like, added it. depth he's... than you had even planned. Yeah. Instead of your group being like, screw it, he's evil, let's just kill him. <laughs> <laughs> but actually... That happens. While we're on that, that topic, uh, speaking specifically to Dungeons & Dragons and a number of other fantasy games, and it can extend to other cliches or other genres as well is to let them kill the villain yeah. and then the villain comes back yeah. because heroes die and they can get resurrected right. why can't a villain uh -huh. yeah it works both ways you can and I almost guarantee that the first time you spring this on a party they'll be absolutely shocked and because the the first time that it comes out it is the biggest twist that they never thought of. Yeah. Um, and you can use it in other genres as well. Yeah. You're playing a sci-fi game, maybe he has a 
data backup of his brain that's now in an android or a clone yep. somewhere or you know if you're doing a superhero game now you're he's time traveling and you have to face a younger version of him in his prime and yep. stronger than the one you ever thought was um, there's a lot of different ways that you can bring back a killed villain without diminishing the previous uh, victory for the players yeah and on the D&D subject and I'm sure there's other systems that have this kind of mechanic but then you also have like undeath Oh, you killed them, yep. but guess what? Now someone else brought them back. Instead of resurrecting them, they brought them back as a lich. They brought them back as a death knight, a vampire, a mummy. You know, there's a variety of undead, yep. intelligent, and powerful. Oh, like, great, you made them even more powerful because now they have all these undead traits and abilities on top of what they had before. Or the fantasy version of the brain uploaded to an android body. I'm going to bind your soul to this golem. Right. And now you have this 17-foot-tall, indestructible steel body combined with the mastermind. Uh, very, very dangerous and sure to make players go, hey, remember that time we had to face against... Yeah, whoever. Or you know, or you know, maybe I'm an extremely uh, adept, you know, social interacting kind of uh, antagonist or NPC, and I convince a demon to you know resurrect me. You know, like it wasn't even like through earthly means, so to speak. But you know, I made a pact with an outer, you know, dimensional being, a god, a demon, you know, a devil lord of some sort, and now I'm back. And typically in those kind of situations, also, I'd give them some extra powers. Like, okay, well, now I can manipulate fire or I'm resistant to fire or something like, you know, something along those lines, a little extra flavor. Now I'm even more powerful. You know, so that way, the, it, you know, to imply extra strength, so, because if the PCs killed them once, they're like, oh, I'll just kill you again. No, I'm more powerful now, so F off. All right. If you strike me down, I will become more powerful than you could possibly imagine. Yep. So there's lots of ways to approach that. I, uh, you know, coming back to, again, um, the antagonist, how I approach things too, with the whole like goals and mini goals. I think like if you have trouble fi trying to figure out those goals, is the uh, the rule of five whys. Have you heard of that? Um, basically, it's the the, con the concept is like getting to the root of any problem. There's five. You ask why five times. You say, okay, my dude wants to take over the world. Why? Because he craves power. Why? Well, when he was younger, he was weak, and the powerful picked on him. Why? Well, he was born with muscular dystrophy, and you know, like, and you just you say five, you know, you say why typically about five times, maybe less sometimes, maybe typically more, but the the general rule is you there's five of the five whys. You say five, uh, why five times, and you answer these questions, and eventually you get down to the root problem. You get down to the the core, the the original motivating factor, and it adds a lot of depth to that you know that NPC, that antagonist, that character, knowing the the root um, uh, triggers for this this line in course of actions, and also again like okay, well if my plan is to take over the world, now I've asked why five times and I've gotten down to the root cause of he was born with you know a physical deformity, and his mother and, and his siblings used to pick on him for it. Okay, now I have that story and I have that background. How might he have achieved power? You know, okay, well, I already know he's a wizard. He's really smart. How might he go about taking over the world? You can you, you, you work backwards and then work forwards again to figure out the mini plot points. And I think that can also add a lot of extra flavor just with the example you're giving there. I had the idea of a DM, you know, okay, if I have this this antagonist who's looking to take over the world and I go back down to the roots and like, oh, well, he was always picked on as a child with that coming into play there. And then we come back to the actual game and, you know, assuming one of the, the players is a charismatic, social, flippant type who starts insulting the villain during the fight, you know, heckling the supervillain, as it were. Which is a huge trigger for him. Yeah, yeah. which now you know how he's going to react and again, makes that memorable scene. You know, oh, I was, I always make fun of the guys. This guy freaking blew up at me. Oh my god, I can't believe it. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. You're adding a huge amount of depth to your character. You're giving them their motivation. You're understanding where they're coming from, and you can use that to build and, again, establish the mini goals of how to get to the main goal. Because no dude just says, I'm going to take over the world, and just goes out and takes over the world. He has to, at least the intelligent dude, he is going to make, okay, first I need to obtain power. How am I going to attain power? This is how I'm going to attain power. This is how I'll amass as much as I need. This is, Then I'll be able to take over this kingdom. Then I'll be able to take over this continent. Then I'll be able to move from there and take over this continent, and then this continent, and then eventually the world. 
okay, cool. Now I understand the breakdown. Now I can adapt to the successes or the failures of that antagonist. You can turn almost anything into an evil genius's scheme by adding, and then I'll take over the world to the end of it. Yeah. What are we going to do today, Pinky? Or Braid? Yeah, I messed that up. Damn! All right. <laughs> so we've, we've talked a little bit about, you know, the important core pieces of, of a protagonist, of an antagonist, rather. Uh, we've talked about building a story around the antagonist. we talked about some of the ways to handle antagonist success and failures and understand their motivations. Now, what about bringing an antagonist into the game? How do you work them in? How do you introduce them to the PCs? How do you build them up as what needs to be handled? Thoughts like, on that? I like. Uh, there's two schools of thought that I really like on this. One is the over-the-top entrance. Just make this massive, like huge, epic thing be happening. Maybe some massive battle scene, and all of a sudden, here comes the guy, and he. Like kind of, kind of the beginning of, uh, uh, say, Lord of the Rings, uh, uh, the first oh, movie, the opening right. scene. Sauron just shows up and just starts obliterating everything. Yeah, you just instantly yeah. establish a dynamic right and there. And then there it is. There's the villain, and all your players go, "That's that's the guy." Even if it's a Balrog, you know, sitting uh-huh. there, they look at, "Well, that's that's the leader of this thing." We're eventually going to have to kill him, or at least they're they know who the big bad is. So when all the henchmen are, you know, have the big bad symbol while they're doing their bad guy things, all the minor antagonists, you know, they know, well, they're all working for him, which means all roads are going to eventually lead to him. I like that one. I also like the second school of thought, which is kind of the insidious thing, which is more of what Lord of the Rings was after that opening scene. Sauron was everywhere. Everyone knew who he was. Everyone knew what was going on. They knew the orcs were from Mordor. They, but you never saw him. You never really. You never heard anything about rumors him. Rumors and myths and stories. He was, exactly. Yeah. He was rumors and he was myths. The bad guys might have been working for him. Might not have been. You know, the the things that they whisper about in the darkness when they don't think anyone else can hear about. Yeah. Exactly. He who shall not be named. Essentially. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a big fan of rumor. I like you know rumor is a nice way of introducing you know instead of just. Because, again, it, it, it gets more of, like, the psychological, you know, intrigue going on. You can, yeah. you can really talk up the antagonist a lot if you, there's a lot of rumor and talk. And the, the nice thing about rumors and talks and myths and stories is you don't need a name. You just right. need to hear about this thing. Another wonderful thing about rumors, don't have to be true. Exactly. It could be yeah. all false. Yeah, or it could be misleading, or it could be a mistake. You know, you know, word of mouth. You're playing the telephone game. You know, like, well, this one guy said this, and then I reinterpreted as that. He reinterpreted as this. He reinterpreted as this. Next thing you know, you got the killer bunny. Um, I actually like introducing my antagonists sometimes organically. Um, I don't have them decided necessarily at the beginning of the game. Um, I'm personally, I'm very heavy on improv side of it. So sometimes I'll go into a game and I have a rough idea of what's going on, but don't know who's behind it. And then I'll have a few sessions in where I'll have the villain, you know, be able to confront the protagonists and be, you broke into my temple, you stole my goods and you killed my snake and let the PCs go, oh, all this stuff that we did has all ticked this guy off. And realizing that that's why those assassins are coming after us. That's why everybody has that same symbol. You know, we put it all together, but we didn't know that it was all connected until I give the big wham episode where that's what's going on. Yeah. As a DM, I love pulling out those 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 moments where that change everything that everything that the PCs thought was going on may shift or may shed new light on it. And bringing in the antagonist is a great time to do that. It's a big theatrical moment, regardless right. of how you approach it. You know, it's 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 a big moment. You know, bringing yeah. your antagonist, showing your antagonist to the protagonist is a big moment, no matter mm-hmm. how you come about it. And one thing you might want to do is make sure you don't create a. a uh, another antagonist that the players hate more. I did that. Uh, in one of the games I was running, I actually had an evil overlord lived in a tower on an island. Uh, but he was off in the distance, and there were rumors of him and that sort of thing. So people knew. But in their first kind of opening town they were in, there was the lord mayor of this town who was just an evil prick. And, you know, he was your typical evil prick. And then at one point they were in his mansion kind of chatting with him about some of the stuff that was going on in town. 
and I had his son come up and say something kind of belligerent, and he just turns around and he smacks him and tells him to leave, and then looks back at the rest of the group, and the players' eyes lit up. They're like, oh, we hate this guy. <laughs> they, they wanted nothing more than to kill him. Uh, uh, and e- even when they were going after things that like the big epic villain is over here doing bad stuff, guys are like, but can we go kill this guy? Yeah. So and I didn't ever intend it to, but so I like, okay, well, I'm going to make him move around with the group, you know, so they have always have the opportunity, quote unquote, to go after him. But eventually, like, yeah, I'm going to give him this, this, like, if they do it, great. If not, that's fine. But eventually give them that spot where, like, well, this is the guy they've all been wanting to kill. So he has been their primary antagonist, even though there's this overlord. This is the one they latched on to. And eventually I set up an, uh, a spot where they could end him and it kind of became the conclusion of the game. It, it went on for a few sessions after that. But I, th- I think it's interesting there that you could you could argue that having, having something like like, oh, and the villain does child abuse um, as a casual thing is right up there with like, and then he goes out and kicks puppies and steals money out of a beggar's yeah. cup. It's it's kind of a low blow to go, oh, look at how evil he is. But at the same time, it gets that primal emotional reaction that it you does. want from your players. It does. As long as you don't overuse it, I think those cliches can... And, and that wasn't the intention. It was just supposed to be, you know, if you think... If you think of what, like, say, in a fantasy setting, it's supposed to be part period piece. Even though it's magic, it's also part period piece. Okay. And the idea was basically just that he was just smacking his kid because he backtalked him. Yeah. You know, today's society, you know, you're going to call the police on something you see him do that. But, you know, uh, you know, that society, that day whatever. It was commonplace. Yeah. yeah. And the kid, the kid, you know, didn't, like, run off screaming and crying, you know, my daddy's abusing me or anything. He's like, okay, well, walks off. But the players were all like, no, nah, screw this guy. <laughs> And I think that's a great piece of advice to intentionally get your players to seriously hate any antagonist is to make it personal. Yeah. And to help make it personal to a character is to help make it a little bit personal to the players. Not so much that you're offending anyone and not so much that you're crossing any lines, but, you know, the fact that everyone could instantly associate with the concept of child abuse, even though to you it was like, well, that's commonplace at the time, but it was clearly a strong topic for your players. So they instantly associated to that and it instantly made it personal. So by making it personal, you just prioritize that dude and put him on the number one hit list. Oh, yeah. So if you if you're having trouble getting your players to really, you know, have enmity towards the antagonist the way that you want, it's just you know find a way to make it personal again without going overboard. Depending on your group, you know, you know, you know your group, you know how far you can push things. But well, there's some, there's some good guidelines you can use. Um, you if your players have provided a backstory that may give you something where you can kind of target in on that. Um, you know, maybe yeah. maybe they. Uh, you know, bought your family's farm and plowed it down, or you know, they they were like hurt a family member, or uh, in some cases, it turns out it was a family member. I know you've talked about taking somebody from a backstory and plugging them in yep. to, to fit a gap in your story. Yep. You know, maybe having the villain show up and oh look, it's my long lost father who abandoned and left us, and now I have to take arms against him. Yep. I think a generic way, you know, a generic one is always going to involve kids. Like, people are very sensitive. No matter how horrific a, a crime is or is not, you flip the child, the, that same crime onto the victim of being a child. It's always going to get a stronger emotional response. So, you know, you know, a, a very borderline topic all by itself is rape, but then you add that same to a child and people are going to treat that tenfold in severity. Yeah. So, you know, an, an easy one to like, okay, well, you really want to hate this dude, child slavery, you know, like yeah. we've been capturing, you know, we've been kidnapping kids and throwing them in the coal mine and making them work their, you know, their nubs off. Yeah. While, you know, cliche wise, not nearly as bad as the previous crime I just mentioned, but still like, you know, you're taking kids you're making them, you know, child labor. You know, no, 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 no. We're, that's that's not cool. You know, right. in no society is that okay. And right. I think that kind of plays into the fact that, in general, your PCs, your protagonists, are going to be on the heroic side. It doesn't have to be. You could be on on the 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 side of of evil, but on the heroic side. They want to help people, and specifically, they want to help the people who can't help themselves. Right. Where th- with the child, that's very much, 
you know, that's exaggerated almost. You know, if you have a threat coming in, you can rally the townspeople to stand and fight it. But if you have a threat coming into the orphanage, you're not going to slap armor on those kids and give them spears. No. Yeah, it's the concept you know, of children can't tunnels. defend themselves and yeah. also the concept of children are born innocent. You know what I mean? Like, you could argue that, like, well, these this town's full of a bunch of jerks. They're all, you know, they have it coming. But no, in no society are you going to be like, these six-year-olds have it coming. They're six... No yeah. six year old has anything coming but good, and you know, like puppies and, and pillows and rainbows. You know what I mean. And and for an antagonist, this plays up the bully side. Oh yeah, because you have them specifically picking on somebody who isn't able to to defend or or help themselves in this situation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Bullies pick on the weak. So. Well, that is roughly about a time for us today. This was uh, talking about antagonists. If you have any questions on that or you'd like some more detail on that, definitely feel free to get in touch with us on Facebook. We also have a message board available at GameMasterStudio.ProBoards.com, and we are on Twitter at GMS Studios. We will be back next Tuesday and pretty much every Tuesday for the foreseeable future. We still have a long list of topics to work through and talk to. And if there's any you'd like to see, definitely let us know and we can see what we can do about working into the schedule. Thank you for listening. Hope your games go good. And we'll see you the next time we're in the studio. Peace. Have fun storming a castle. Storming a castle.